It's 3 p.m. live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton. This is Yahoo Finance Live. And here's what we're watching this afternoon. Stocks climbing from the lows of the day, but investors are taking a breather after five straight weeks of gains. The biggest move today, though, is in Bitcoin. We're covering all the market action. And Wall Street is watching a merger in the airline sector. Alaska Airlines acquiring Hawaiian Airlines for nearly $2 billion, including debt. But could the regulatory environment in Washington affect the future of this deal? We're going to ask a former FTC commissioner ahead. Plus, mortgage rates falling, but a rebound in sales may still be a long ways off. We'll hear from one economist who says sales may not pick back up until the second half of next year. Bank of America data, though, seems a little more optimistic. We'll have a closer look at the real estate reality later this hour. Let's get you up to speed on the market action in stocks right now. If we take a look, we've got stocks that are still pulling back here off about a two thirds of one percent for the S&P 500. Uh, the Nasdaq leading declines today. And indeed, it's communication services and infotech that are the two worst performing groups. The Dow doing a little bit better today. We've got real estate stocks as a group that are higher. And some of the beaten up consumer staples uh, stocks today are seeing a little bit of a bounce. Let's move to another asset class making headlines here. The Bitcoin rally rolling on, now up roughly 150% this year, hitting its highest level in 19 months. Investor optimism building throughout the year as they wait for spot Bitcoin ETFs to be approved. Vlad Tenev, Robinhood CEO, told Yahoo Finance today, retail investors are waking up to the crypto rally. There's more optimism around an ETF being approved. Um, there is bad actors like like Binance, um, you're kind of continuing to see them being weeded out. Um, and then I think there's also more talk about uh, uh, inflation, right? Uh, as, as inflation becomes a little bit more broadly understood, people are starting to look to long-term inflation hedges. And that, that's been a thesis behind crypto and Bitcoin in particular for quite some time. So some interesting comments there from Vlad. A couple of things. Yeah. I mean, one of we, we've seen this rally. A couple points. One is obviously, listen, the markets decide the Fed's on hold, right? And that cuts are coming. They're in the pipeline. We've had a lot of people debating when exactly that's going to happen. Some early, some middle, something Q4. But that's one reason. The second reason is, of course, because investors have decided that the SEC is really going to greenlight yeah. those spot Bitcoin ETFs. They are mm -hmm. coming. We've had people on the show, Julie, who have applied for those vehicles, those products. They think that could be coming as soon as early next year. And of course, we've had a lot of crypto fans on the show saying they really think that is a catalyst. That's going to boost adoption. Sure. They're waiting for it. They're always looking for something that's going to be. Listen, what, whatever market we're talking about, whether it be stocks, whether it be treasuries, but I think especially when we're talking about crypto, yes, there are some fundamentals driving things. But there's also a lot of speculation still in this market. And there are technicals and other things. So yes, we can attribute some of the upside to some of these fundamental cases. But I think we also need to be a little bit cautious about attributing too much of it. Some of the other um, things I've seen that have been cited as being one of the reasons is liquidation of short positions, for example. I was looking at some commentary today from Matt, uh, Matteo Greco, um, who's with a company called Finequia International, which is a fintech, where he talks about some of the liquidation of shorts that is then sort of supercharged the move upward that we have seen. So there's some of that going on as well. There's still talk about the halving that is supposed to happen, but that's not until, what, 2025, I think, where the amount of coins that you get if you're a Bitcoin miner gets cut in half at a certain point, and that's because the ultimate level of Bitcoins that will ever be mined is capped. So, you know, there's always the supply-demand equation when we talk about Bitcoin. Whatever the reason, we're still well below the highs. Mm -hmm. Um, but, it, you know, some of the technical notes I've read have said that maybe there's still some more upside here. It is also interesting to think about, you know, the catalyst ahead. Like, if the reason is spit, spot Bitcoin ETFs, we've been talking about this yeah. for so long now, Julie, w with a lot of smart people. But the question is whether, if and when the SEC really does approve it, is that, at this point, the catalyst that a lot of crypto fans think it will be? Or is it going to be kind of agree with kind of a, a sell the news response? You know, right. it'd be really interesting. If for some reason, I just thought of Dogecoin and when Elon Musk was on Saturday Night Live. And remember, there was this 
Yeah. Big anticipation right, 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 for right. Doge going ahead of that. <laughs> and then I'm pretty sure it sold off yeah. after he was on. So not exactly no. the same, you know, analogous, but still something to think about. For sure. Let's get back to stocks, too, because they are slipping a bit today following five straight weeks of gains. The S&P 500 notching new highs for the year on Friday. Now we're seeing this slip today of right now around three quarters of a percent. In a roundup of 12 S&P 500 forecasts for 2024 tracked by Yahoo Finance, five have the S&P hitting 5,000 or higher by the end of next year. And that includes RBC. Here with more is Lori Calvacino, RBC Capital Markets Head of UX Equity Strategy, who is one of those folks, she's looking at 5000 for next year. Lori, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming in. It's good to see you. It's good to see you, too. Thanks for having me. So I know you guys have sort of quantitative models, and you go through and look very systematically at what's going to get us to a certain level next year. Maybe it's hard to answer this question, but is there one thing overall that you think is is implies bullishness for 2024? So I would say the thing that comes up the most in my meetings, and it's actually the most bullish out of our five models, but it's the one that really seems to resonate with investors and be a little bit differentiated versus some of those more bearish forecasts is our valuation work. And quite simply, we think that most of the strategists on the street are underestimating how high PE multiples can stay. And if you sort of think about your typical, you know, sort of arguments for valuations, it'll be, oh, this has been the average since whatever date, and we're plugging that in against our earnings estimate. And I, you know, I, I've always thought there's a better way to build that mousetrap. I've been doing strategy for more than 20 years. Um, and so we've built a model that bases, is based on data going back to 1962. We have four inputs, inflation, we use PCE, Fed funds, 10-year yields, and GDP. GDP is actually kind of a garbage indicator, doesn't matter all that much, (laughs) but PCE and 10-year yields work great. And what's interesting is that if you look in the 70s, PCE, inflation, did the most work at explaining or did the best job of explaining movements in PE multiples. Recently, it's been 10-year Treasury yields. Long story short, and I know this has already been a long story, um, the moderation in inflation can push the PE multiple up above 20 times. I see a lot of people who are using 18 times or 17 times or 15 times was really popular over the last year. And if you take the math, and I, I think our model spits out 23 times for the end of next year, take it against our earnings forecast for next year, we actually think on a bull case scenario, you could get all the way up to 5,300 on the S&P, and the multiple, multiple would be defensible. Huh. That is probably, I would say, the most interesting conversation I have with clients right now because people are using these really low PE assumptions and don't have very good justifications for them. And Lori, so, so valuation looks constructive. I'm interested to get your take on sentiment too because I've seen some of your colleagues, some strategists sound like they're getting kind of nervous about that. They're looking at certain sentiment indicators and they think, you know what, these look kind of extended right here and it's caused them to feel a little bit more cautious, at least yeah. short term. What do you see? So I do think sentiment's been a very important star in the sky this year to navigate the U.S. equity market and it is oscillating very, very quickly if you look over the last few months. Um, when we priced all of our models, we were still not really really in danger territory from kind of an overly exuberant uh, point of view. If you looked at the AAII net bull bear survey, you were still kind of in neutral territory. And we're definitely moving up very quickly. So it is something to watch. Um, But what we do find is that we've been in this range, kind of we bottomed out, you know, basically in early November and got a very strong buy signal for the market. And we're rebounding from that. But it's giving us a very strong signal over the next 12 months, even if it might be getting a little bit worrisome in the short term. Well, I, I want to linger on the short term for just a second yeah. here because, you know, we ha- heard from Jay Powell on Friday and people seemed to sort of ignore what he was actually saying and just heard what they wanted yeah. to hear in terms of rate cuts being absolutely done. You know, we've got some important data coming up. We've got the jobs report coming up. We, of course, have more inflation data coming up. Is, are we going to see a damper being put on this rally, continuing to be put on this rally? You know, it feels like we've moved very far, very quickly. It would not be surprising to me to see the rally take a breather at some point in time. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean you're doom and gloom for the next 12 months. Um, you know, we did get to a point back in August where sentiment was looking too frothy, and that had unwound by the time you got to November. So there's certainly recent precedents for saying, hey, the narrative could change and we could knock you know some of the froth out of this market, but that could just be a pause that refreshes. It's funny, I was talking uh, to a client last week and they were just sort of, they were, they were working on their own year ahead outlook and they were just like, the narrative just changes every five mm-hmm. minutes. And I, it feels like investors, especially regarding the Fed, are getting very, very frustrating with, with that in terms of how to position. 
Hmm. And Lori, another variable to consider as we roll into this year is, is an election year. Yeah. How as a strategist do you think about that? Because as you point out, that also introduces just another level of uncertainty for investors. So I've described it, if you're talking to your typical U.S. investor, it feels like you're staring at the sun. Um, they have to talk about it for like five seconds and then they turn their head away because it's just too painful to think about. Um, if you're talking to a non-U.S. investor, they are more willing to linger on it, especially I would say European-based investors. It feels like uh, American politics has become a bit of a spectator sport. Um, there's a lot more concern, I would say, from non-U.S. investors than U.S. investors. I prefer to stick to the data, and data shows you that every presidential election year has a bit of uncertainty in it, and trends tend to be, in terms of market gains, positive, but below what we typically see in the year prior to a presidential election year. I think we've got enormous uncertainty next year. It's not clear that economic issues are going to be driving the turnout. I think that really has Wall Street turned on its head right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are lots of questions about how accurate polling data is going to be. That also frustrates Wall Street people. We like to look at numbers, and it's not clear you can rely on them right now. Um, and I think people just want it to be over. I will also tell you there's not a lot of sector work to do here right now. This is a broad market risk, but the policy discussions have have been light. So even if you want to make a bet, it's hard to say you need to sell this sector or buy that sector if you have a, a view on a certain outcome, because we're just not deep into it enough yet. Mm -hmm. um, what about sector work, though, just broadly? You know, if, if you're not entirely sure what to do on the top yeah. line here, I know, I mean, for example, you've been talking small caps for a, I know. a little while now. Here. I know, yeah. I know. It's, it's funny, I had someone yell at me last week for not being bullish enough on them. I'm like, I actually really <laughs> do like them. I said, I've just liked them for a really long time and I keep getting you know knocked back down. Yeah. But I think what happened, you know, I was up in Montreal on November 1st, right after Halloween, and they're putting up all their Christmas trees everywhere, which I guess is, is what they do. And um, it, it felt like talking to kids on Christmas morning because people were like, okay, 10 year yields have peaked, what do we buy? Um, and people Ooh. were really kind of ready to price in the idea of a less aggressive Fred and interest rates moving down over a longer period of time. Small caps came up a lot in that discussion. And I would say back in, you know, sort of August, September, when 10-year yields were melting up, people were just kind of stuck. They were There was a lot of paralysis. People didn't want to hear about small caps then. But now that we're into this different rate environment, people want to hear about the fact that small caps do usually outperform when the Fed starts cutting. Small caps are at historic lows relative to large caps. And there seems to be this readiness. You can even see it in the price action today. Small caps are up. Everything else is down. People are ready to broaden out a little bit. Um when is the Fed going to start cutting? Because that's that's really seems to be one of the central yeah. areas of debate right now. So I, I luckily don't have to make this forecast. Yes. I've got my <laughs> hands full with the S&P um, and the small cap call. But our economists actually just put their their forecast out late last week, and they're saying mid-year. And that's a call that they've had for quite some time. Mm -hmm. um, and they one of the things they talk about, you know, they're not looking for a hard landing in the economy. They see some modest declines in GDP in the first half of next year, not consistent with a recession, but more similar to what we saw in early 2022, which was not termed a recession. So they don't think the Fed is going to be reacting to any big, bad, nefarious economic data, but they think we're going to see a series of adjustment cuts. So. Well, and if I could just quickly follow up that. So you don't make that, that call. Yeah. But obviously, there's an effect on stocks. Yeah. What's the sort of most effect, most important thing for investors to think about in terms of the timing of when the Fed is going to cut? So I think that you know it, it's always a little bit different. All these Fed playbooks, you know, they never play out exactly the same. I think that right now we're in a point where people have just been sort of stuck in the same trades for a long time, and then again, stuck not really knowing what to do for a period of months. People are ready to do something, and so now that they feel like they have Fed cuts coming into view, some point over the next year, I think people are ready to position on that. And you'll see that impact December trading. You'll see that impact January and February flows as well. Hmm. All right. Lori, thank you so much for coming in today. Appreciate it. That was Thanks. really helpful. Thanks for having me. And turning out to take a look at some trending tickers, we're going to start with airlines here. Alaska Air agreeing to buy Hawaiian holdings for $1.9 billion in cash. The deal would solidify Alaska Airlines' position as the fifth largest U.S. carrier. Shares of Hawaiian sky high in today's trading session. So this one's interesting here, Julie. I did see the CEO of Alaska on another network uh, today saying, listen, he expects the scrutiny, ultimately thinks, listen, it's coming. We know it could be coming, but we think this gets approved. This is pro-consumer, pro-competitive. Now, of course, you would expect him to say that, but it will be interesting to see what, if any, scrutiny this does get. Yeah, I mean, it seems to be the reason that the stocks are trading how they're trading is because there are some questions about whether this is going to get done. So, of course, the CEOs are always going to say, 
that the deal is going to go through. But not only have we seen this uh, FTC be active, we've seen this FTC be active in particular with regard to airline mergers. So we've got coming up later this week uh, the call being made uh, regulatorily on the JetBlue uh, Spirit deal and whether yeah. that's going to go through. Closing arguments. You know, so... You know, will we will this one go through either? I think there are a lot of questions about that. They're being expressed by analysts and by investors as well. I think it's true the airlines decide to retain their separate brands. I thought that was an interesting yeah. move. I wonder if that was sort of an attempt of an olive branch here, maybe so, sort maybe. of. Yeah, interesting decision there. Most definitely. Let's talk about another kind of air carrier, so to speak, Virgin Galactic. Those shares are sliding after founder Sir Richard Branson says he would not be investing any more cash into this space travel company. That was according to an interview with the Financial Times in which Branson said the company no longer has the deepest pockets in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic here. I mean, the stock has already really tumbled year to date. There have been some uh, delays with some of the launches, et cetera that have really been setbacks for yeah. Virgin Galactic. I mean, I think the initial reaction, I wonder, so he, Branson gave this interview with the FT, that's where he made this news, this headline. I, I wonder if initially, you know, some investors thought, okay, he, is he is this a sign that he's losing faith and trust and confidence in this company? Um, it, on the other hand, though, he did say in the same article that post-COVID, listen, he said, my business empire does not have the deepest pockets anymore. So right, I wonder if exactly. that was, you know, kind of weighed in there. There was also some interesting commentary from the street to kind of weighing in on this key bank, for example, saying th they never actually assumed additional investment was coming from Branson, though they acknowledge that, you know, the, the lingering possibility of that, they told their clients, likely provide some level of liquidity support. So that, that's what you're seeing here. But as you point, Julie, I mean, the stock's been slammed today. It's yeah. down about 40% well, this year. Well, and keep in mind, wasn't this a SPAC? I believe it was a SPAC. So we always talk about that $10 reference price, yep. and it's at buck ninety-four. Yep. And finally here, Palantir, let's check out that one. Shares sliding as William Blair analysts note potential downside risk for the company. Concerns rising after a presentation given by U.S. Army officials alludes to a data ownership conflict with Palantir. So this one, I mean, first of all, just to put that slide in context, I mean, this one has been a true winner this mm -hmm. year. I mean, investors have piled into this one as they think it's a way to play the AI theme. Stocks up something like 180%. But we are sliding today, and so William Blair kind of throwing some cold water, and what they said was there was this presentation given by these Army officials last week, and Army and Palantir, you know, an Army and Palantir over data ownership as part of the company's, I guess, four-year, $458 million contract with the Army. I think they, the money quote here is when they said the tone of the comments and plan to maximize the use of open source vendors provides a strong indication that Palantir's renewal contract will be significantly less than original $458 million. That's what seems right. to spook folks. Yeah, and they do have an underperform rating on it already, right, yep. as they come out with this comment, the more, uh, William Blair, that is. And William Blair also looking at other government contractors to sort of draw the comparison here. Very traditional firms that have worked with the government for a long time, the likes of Booz Allen or General Dynamics, right? SAIC, for example, all of them de develop software systems for the Army. And the analysts saying that those companies don't have the same kind of conflicts there because the Army owns the software systems in those cases that, that those companies have developed, and so they own the data. So I guess in the case of Palantir, that's not the case. Yeah. And so that's what they're flagging as a potential. I mean, this is just their opinion, to be clear. We'll see if that is what we'll keep an eye on that contract. All right, we'll see. Announcement and see what happens. Well, we're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, millennials facing a tough housing market as interest rates remain elevated. When will rates and home prices come down? We have an estimate for you. And streaming wars, Verizon announcing a new bundle of Max and Netflix for customers. How much can you save? Find out later in the show. And Bitcoin tops 41,000 for the first time this year on optimism over Bitcoin ETF approvals. We'll dig into it with the CEO of Robinhood after the break.
Robinhood is looking for growth overseas, recently uh, saying they will launch in the UK. Let's get right to co-founder and CEO of Robinhood, Vlad Tena. Vlad, good to see you in person for a change and in our new studio. Thank you for having me, Brian. So the UK uh, launch, tell us a little bit about it and how important it will be to Robinhood. Yeah, I mean, uh, from the very beginning, when Beju and I created Robinhood and got the idea for it, as immigrants, the long-term vision was to make our services available to everyone all over the world. And we think we have certain advantages in doing that. We're a technology company. We don't expand with brick and mortar branch offices everywhere. And we've spent a lot of time, particularly in the past few years, investing in the core platform. And I think people overseas need it even more than in the US here, uh, due in part to the great work that we've done in disrupting the financial system. People are relatively well served, but overseas you have a lot of people that don't even have access to a functional banking system. So we'd like to help them, starting with, of course, the UK and EU, and then expanding beyond. How do you build out, you know, what are some of the, I guess, the most pressing needs of investors in the UK, and, and how will you build out the platform? Launching in the UK, we want to be very, very focused on solving one particular pain point, which is we want to be the best place for people to access the US dollar and the US equity markets in the UK. And uh, what that looks like to us, aside from the industry leading economics and industry leading customer experience, is launching new innovative features that you just can't see elsewhere. So one example of that is 24 hour market, which uh, uh, I spoke to you about when we launched a few months ago. So because we're expanding to the UK with uh, our core platform, the benefits and things we're building for the US accrue to UK customers. 24 hour market is one good example because it increases the overlap between the hours that Robinhood is available for real time execution and the waking hours. So a customer in the UK, when they're awake, um, will have access to real time execution on a wide universe of US listed stocks. Why isn't 24 hour, why isn't that the industry standard? This is 2023, we're almost yeah. on the verge of 2024. It seems ridiculous, it's not. Well, it will, it will be the industry standard. Someone just has to do it first. And in that case, uh, Robinhood was the first to push that innovation forward. There was a lot that needed to be done, both on the technology side and user experience side to make it a reality. Um, uh, having uh, different market cent centers stitched together seamlessly so that a customer can place an order and not have to understand the details of how those orders are being routed between different areas. Uh, having the overnight session work seamlessly. These are all things that took a while to build and get the experience just right. But you're seeing the actual uh, benefit of that in recent days and weeks. Um, when you look at the share of screenshots on Sunday nights and late at night that are posted about stocks. Robinhood is taking the lion's share of that. I'm sure you saw that last night with crypto prices going up. Bitcoin crossed 40,000. Customers were curious what crypto stocks were doing during that time period. And Robinhood's one of the only places that allows that type of visibility and allows you to actually transact and, and manage risk uh, during those hours. So to have truly round the clock, seamless, uh, trading. We have to solve the clearing over the weekend problem. And historically, there, there hasn't been much of an impetus to actually solve that. And um, that's something that I'm keen to, to take on. I do believe part of my role is um, rather than just uh, in addition to growing Robinhood, making our product as good as possible, um, I think uh, as leaders of the industry, we have to push the industry forward. And I think a uh, we love uh, being entrepreneurs in America, and it's very important to me for our capital markets to continue to be the most vibrant and innovative. And so I think we'll solve this problem one way or another. Soon? Is it soon? I'm excited to push and, and, uh, and lead the charge forward there. Is it soon? In our, in our, in our lifetime, are we 24-7? I, I hope it's soon. I think that the big problem for 24-7 would be figuring out clearing over the weekend. Yeah. But um, I think... Um, the success that we've seen and the obvious value to a uh, 24-hour market um, that we've seen. And since, since we last spoke, we've rolled it out to more symbols. We're now at over 200 symbols after adding another 100 uh, last week. 
We're seeing uh, liquidity uh, improve. We're seeing more customers engaging with it, particularly the active traders, more interest online. And so these things actually help get the counterparties more excited. Mm -hmm. And as more brokers uh, try to uh, add this capability to customers, I think then it'll become the, the activation energy to getting clearing over the weekends to happen um, becomes a little bit more palatable. Fascinating time for markets. We have gold at a record high. We have crypto breaking through 40,000. Equity markets are highs too. Have retail investors participated in this rally? Um, I think you're, you are starting to see uh, retail investors wake up to certain segments uh, of, of the rally. I think crypto activity, you're, you're seeing kind of a, a groundswell. Um, what tends to happen is um, uh, we've seen in the past, as the price of Bitcoin uh, approaches all-time highs, the media coverage and intensity uh, increases. And I think that plays a role as well. If people are just hearing more about crypto around them, uh, they tend to become more interested and, and you start to see that reflected in trading activity, at least in the past. Um, and what we have to do is make sure we continue to improve our product and service. Over the past few years, we've made a ton of improvements in reliability and stability. And we believe now that we're in a position to handle all sorts of rallies, Wh whatever market events can happen, we're much stronger equipped to, to handle them. That was Robinhood CEO Vlad Tenev with our Brian Sazi. Well, it has been a wild day for gold investors. The precious metal finishing the day well off its earlier highs. You just heard Vlad and Saz talking about that, among other things. Yahoo yeah, Finance is Jared Blickery here with more. It has been very interesting in the gold world. You bet, Julie. I was covering this in the morning. It was almost a different story. You can see gold futures now after hitting a record high earlier at $2,152.30, now down 2%. Let's take a look at the candlestick chart to really plot and see what's happening here. Here is that high, record high, and then here is that red candle where we are now trading into the previous day's territory. Uh, let's take a look at the year to date, kind of put this in perspective. We've had a number of highs before. In fact, I'm going to put this on a five-year chart with some lines. We've seen this play out before where we get to a record high or a near record high, and then we just fall off and sell off rather sharply. Um, I think it's interesting, this latest move, gold got, uh, got started on its journey upwards before the 10-year T-note yield rolled over. Gold was starting to move up somewhere in October. That was the first leg. It would go on to its second. And then the, T, uh, the uh, bond market finally rolled over and supported it. But arguably, gold had gotten a little bit ahead of itself. Now I want to show you gold volatility. And yes, there is something that is gold volatility. We had an explosion. It's kind of like the VIX in the pandemic. But the interesting thing about gold is when the price of gold goes higher, that's when we see the increase in volatility. So that is the opposite of the stock market, where increased volatility usually means depressed stock prices. So it doesn't look like, uh, based on this chart and the relative location, that we are ready to see gold really spurt to new record highs and sustain that momentum. And then finally, here's another look at the bond market. I posted this chart uh, a week ago, and this is the price of gold right here. It had become disconnected from the 10-year real yield, and this is on an inverted basis. Don't want to get into all the bond, the wonky bond lingo, but suffice to say that the fundamentals of gold here might not have been supporting the, uh, the rally. Now, what I also want to point out is that over the last 10 days, we have seen fringe stocks. Those are some of the, like the disrupt, disruption stocks, meme stocks, Bitcoin. Those have exploded to the upside. Meanwhile, we have seen the Magnificent Seven kind of roll over. Not Tesla, but over that time period, 10 days, NVIDIA down 8.1%. Is all of this related? Have we brought forward those gains uh, that we were supposed to get at the end of the year? Have we, in fact, uh, piled some of those gains into meme stocks, thinking that they're going to continue when they not? All of this may be related, all of it may not, but I just go back to that gold price. Uh, what a candle there and what a day in the market. Jared Blickery, thank you so much, sir. And coming up, housing hurdles, millennials feeling the pinch of high interest rates and home prices. We're gonna dig into that, it's coming up next.
Markets are pricing in Fed rate cuts starting in mid-2024. Equity investors are already placing their bets on which companies will win and lose. Utility stocks, for example, have started to rebound as bond yields have come down from their highs. Don't get caught behind the curve, the yield curve, that is. Which stock should you pick up as rates stabilize and which should you avoid? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio. The Fed's rate hiking campaign has created a major setback for millennials. Data from Bank of America shows that older millennial households appear to be faring the worst. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's very own Danny Romero with more. Danny. Let's put this on the table. Homeownership is very important, especially for millennials. A survey from Bank of America showed that more than 50% of millennials say that homeownership is more important now than compared to their parents' generation. Now, with that in mind, Bank of America says that the older millennials are the ones that are getting squeezed right now. And there are several disadvantages that they have. For one, they have more debt. Uh, Data from the U.S. Department of Education shows that there is still $1.6 $1.6 trillion of outstanding student loan debt. 40% of that is held by 35 to 49 year olds. Other data from the New York Fed shows that credit card delinquencies are rising, uh, the fastest for those aged between 30 and 39 years old, higher than 2019 levels. I think that really shows that millennials are still struggling paying off their credit card. But aside from that, older millennials are also facing childcare costs. They have more expenses, more expenses. And so uh, childcare costs have actually increased over 30% since 2019. So that's definitely a big headwind. And aside from that, what really stood out for me from this report is that millennials could have been hit hard by the 2008 housing recession, which could have financially set them back. And now then they got another potential setback with rates going higher now. So is there any good news for them? For millennials? There is some good news. I mean, millennials have made some meaningful progress in home ownership, especially that they took advantage of those low rates in 2020 and 2021. But another thing is that Goldman Sachs says that home ownership, they're expecting that to rise within the next 15 years. Now, there's a lot of things that hap- will, hap- will have to happen for that. Baby boomers aren't going to live forever, so there will be some more inventory that will be added to the market. Also, the big debate debate about the Fed pivot and what goes on there, so that will also be a big question mark. But again, that could spur up some more housing demand. We shall see. Thanks, Danny, as always, for keeping us posted on housing news. Appreciate it. Well, mortgage rates are pulling back five weeks in a row, according to Freddie Mac, but sales are showing no signs of a rebound, pending home sales falling to an all-time low in October. Our next guest says the housing sector will struggle until the middle of next year. Joining us now, Oxford Economics U.S. lead economist Nancy Vanden Houten. Nancy, thank you for being here. So let's start with housing here and then broaden it out to talk uh, about the economy as a whole. Uh, why do you think we are not going to see housing start to turn until that point? Is it going to be coincident with when the Fed might be cutting rates? Well, I, I, I think so. I, I think, in fact, that uh, housing can start to, to come back a bit before uh, the Fed starts cutting rates, because as you just mentioned, mortgage rates have declined um, for, for several weeks in a, a row now, and they're well off their, their recent highs. I mean, there are a lot of different forces at work here. Uh, again, following on the, the, the segment you just did, uh, housing has become unaffordable for millennials, for, for many households. Uh, mortgage rates uh, have, have risen, and even though they've come down a bit, they're, they're still elevated. Home prices have been uh, quite resilient, um, it, just despite all of the headwinds facing housing. So again, housing is, is unaffordable for, for many buyers. So that's taking a a toll on on sales, particularly existing home sales. We've seen um, home builders uh, offer a lot of incentive to to clear their inventory. So so new home sales have done a a little bit better. Um, But but we think as as rates continue to come down as we move through next year, uh, given pent up demand and and also just a a years long need for, for more inventory, uh, that, that we will see housing begin to uh, bounce back. 
So, Nancy, that, that's your view uh, of the housing sector. Maybe just broaden it out for us here as we as we head into 2024. What's your your broader view, Nancy, of the U.S. economy? Are you in the, in the soft landing camp? Yeah, I, I think we uh, are in the soft landing camp now. Uh, we do look for growth to slow quite a bit uh, to about 1% in 2024. Uh, we're starting to, to see signs of that uh, already, uh, but we're not looking for uh, negative quarters of growth. Um, you know, we think there are some, some downside risks to the economy, uh, but we, we think that the growth will be slightly positive. We'll see inflation continue to come down. Uh, and eventually we'll see the Fed begin to cut rates. Uh, we're, we think the market's gotten a bit uh, ahead of itself in, in terms of rate cuts. We're not looking for, for rate cuts to begin until the third quarter of next year. The third quarter of next year, that is definitely, you know, there is this sort of narrative taking hold, hold that June is going to be when that's going to happen. That's what the market seems to be pricing in at this point, Nancy. Why do you think that it's going to be a bit later? Well, I mean, the Fed has uh, told us time and again that they want to be convinced that uh, inflation is uh, is on a downward trajectory back to, to 2 percent. And we think it's going to take a, a while before uh, they see that evidence. We, you know, the, we know that they're not going to be guided just by, by market behavior, but that they want to see this evidence in, in the data. And we've made quite a bit of, of progress on bringing down inflation, but there's still you know, another leg to go, particularly when it comes to inflation in the services sector. And I'm interested, Nancy, you just get your take on the health of the consumer as we head into next year. You know, it's proven very resilient, Nancy, but now you know, higher borrowing costs, dwindling savings, the resumption of student loan payments. How do you see the, the consumer holding up next year? Well, you're, you just answered the question for me. <laughs> all, all, the, all the key points. Uh, yes, the consumer has, has been... Uh, very resilient. There's been a lot of spending, a lot of it reflecting spending that can occur during the, the pandemic. But yes, there's a confluence of, of headwinds coming together, including higher rates, which will uh, crimp spending on things, interest rate sensitive things like uh, like autos. Um, we in, are seeing the resumption of student loan payments, although it looks like a lot of borrowers may be taking advantage of some of those more generous repayment plans the Biden administration rolled out. But still, they're, they're, you know, households are, are making those, those payments again. And there are, are signs of, of, of strain elsewhere in terms of higher you know, credit card delinquency. So, you know, some households... Uh, um, are struggling more than others at this point, we think. And, and you mentioned excess savings, too. Uh, and the, the evidence suggests that a lot of the savings have been run down, particularly for households at uh, lower income levels. So uh, you sort of hinted all at the fiscal situation as well. Um, and we're coming into an election year. What effect do you see potentially the election having on fiscal policy and on the economy more broadly? Yeah, I, th I think it's it's not uncommon for uh, us to see stimulus packages uh, enacted by policymakers in an election year, but we're not expecting that this year, uh, just given how polarized the, the political parties are in the U.S. right now. Uh, if anything, we see some, you know, we see some downside risk uh, coming from fiscal policy. One, if Congress can't pass spending bills for the full 2024 fiscal year, uh, automatic spending cuts will, will kick in and, and that will weigh on growth. And also, I think that there's more uncertainty than usual about the implications of the outcome of the, of the next election in, in terms of fiscal policy. Uh, we have uh, Trump tax cuts set to expire at the end of 2025. Uh, the outcome of the election will determine to what extent those tax cuts do expire. And we think that the, the general uncertainty about the direction of policy, whether it's tax policy or trade policy, uh, just may uh, cause businesses to, to take a pause in terms of investing and hiring until they have a clearer picture of, uh, of what policy will look like in 2025. Nancy Vanden Houten, thank you so much, Nancy, for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. And coming up, a number of consumer goods companies like Chewy and Campbell Soup sinking this year. We're going to examine why and what could turn them around. That's on the other side of this break.
Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's gonna take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan. But I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. For months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024. Smucker, Campbell's, and Chewy are all reporting earnings this week as deflation looms for consumer goods companies. All three showing a stark decline year to date, leaving the companies to reevaluate their branding and marketing strategies going into 2024. For more on today's consumer goods earnings, we're talking to CFRA analyst Arun Sundaram. Arun, it is great to see you. Maybe Arun, just to start kind of big picture here, I want to get your take on the consumer because Arun, you have a unique insight there given your coverage universe. How does the consumer look to you, Arun, right now? And what do you see ahead in 2024? Yeah, hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I think the you know the big uh, word for this year is really resili resiliency. It's been um, the best word to describe the consumer this year in the face of high inflation, elevated interest rates. Uh, they've been spending, uh, although that spending has been shifting more towards services again and away from 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 goods. Uh, but nonetheless, consumers have been spending this year, and that's that's continued even through this holiday season. Um, and now the big question really is what's in store for 2024. Um, and in, in our view, there certainly are some red flags towards consumer spending. We'll likely see consumer spending even soften soften even more uh, in 2024. Uh, we, as as you know, you know, savings rates have come down. Consumer debt balances uh, are increasing. A lot of the excess savings that, are, that the consumers built up during the pandemic have been um, de depleted. Uh, and if you look at some leading indicators like sentiment and confidence, uh, both indicators are generally weak uh, right now. Um, so we're expecting consumer spending too slow uh, in, in 2024, um, and, and especially in the services side, because that's been the area that's been, um, you know, that was a positive in 2023. It was the services side. So consumer spending, consumer demand is one side of it. The other side of it is what the companies have been charging, right? Which last year they certainly had pricing power. Beginning of this year there was some pricing power. That, though, seems to now be melting away to some extent, hand in hand, of course, with what's happening with demand. Are we going to see deflation affect these companies going into 2024? Yeah, so I think you're right. So I mean, I mean, clearly, you know, just about every consumer-related name uh, increased prices over the last two years. Some companies probably increases increased prices more than they should have, given the uh, their brand strength. And I think we're starting to see that now really play out. Is because the companies that don't have pricing power are starting to see volumes, you know, really deteriorate. Um, you know, the, the expectation right now is that you know inflation is moderating, and the expectation was that. Uh, units or volume should improve, but we really haven't seen that for a lot of a lot of consumer related names, especially packaged food companies, which is one of the reasons packaged foods has been down so much this year is because even though price related growth is moderating, we're not seeing that uplift in volumes. Um, and, and in turn, you know, overall growth is is coming down. Um, but yeah, in, in 2024, I think you know the big buzzword now is is deflation, and and, and if we can be in that point. Um, already in some consumer related categories, we are seeing def deflation, especially in, dis in discretionary categories. If you think about you know, things like electronics, TVs, household appliances, those have been deflationary for the most part um, you know, throughout this year. Uh, I think going into 2024, we can start to see more disinflation in consumables and food. And potentially, you know, maybe mid to late 2024, we could see deflation in, in food related categories. Uh, food related inflation has been the most persistent. So I think that's going to take a little bit more time to get to the you know def deflationary standpoint. But from all the you know companies and retailers that I, I've been speaking to, uh, a lot of them are now talking about deflation next year, not not so much inflation. And Arun, another big theme um, for the companies you cover are these weight loss drugs. Arun, obviously, 
a tremendous amount of investor curiosity, interest in those drugs. You can look at the stock charts of Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk. How, how do you think about, Arun, how those drugs are going to potentially affect the companies you cover? Not so much you know, near or intermediate term, but even long term, Arun, what's the risk for those companies and how are those companies responding right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the near-term reaction to these GLP-1 drugs are, are a bit overblown. Uh, if you look at the stocks for a lot of consumer-related names, a lot of food-related names, they, they're down significantly uh, ever since the, uh, that topic became pretty popular a few months ago. Um, but, you know, that's something that, you know, really all companies are, are, are monitoring still. Uh, it's too ter early to tell the, you know, the exact impact um, in terms of food and beverage consumption. Uh, it could, you know, over over time, it could have a, a modest impact on on food consumption. You know, maybe one to three percent of total food intake could be down over the longer term. Um, but I think the good news for at least food manufacturers and food retailers is that, you know, they have time to to prepare for this. Um, you know, this is going to be, you know, uh, potentially uh, a theme that we'll, we'll be talking about for the next decade is is these GLP one drugs, and what a lot of food companies can will, will likely do is they'll reevaluate. You know, they'll you know potentially um, introduce more smaller pack sizes, for example, or maybe they'll change their ingredients in some of their food products. Uh, maybe some food companies will sell off some underperforming brands and, and try to acquire some higher performing brands. Uh, so, so I think the good news is that they have time and, and nobody needs to make any dr drastic decision right now in terms of, you know, maybe, you know, exiting certain product lines or brands or things like that. Um, not, nothing extreme ha has been done yet. So I think everyone's really just monitoring it and, 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 and uh, waiting for any, any impact on, on sales or, or margins. And Arun, before we let you go, I know you have holds on a lot of the companies, the food companies in your coverage universe. Is there anything that you have a buy on that you think is going to do a little bit better going into next year? Yeah. So, I mean, during this whole, you know, GLP-1 um, uh, popularity, you know, when, when a lot of these food, food related names um, got pretty hit pretty hard, uh, we did we did make some upgrades in packaged foods. Our, our top pick in, in packaged foods is Mondelez. Uh, you know, they're, in our view, uh, the best management team in, in pa amongst packaged foods. Consistent uh, execution, solid dividend. They buy back shares. Uh, they're really big in emerging markets, where which is where the growth really is. And first and foremost, they're they're a snacking company, and that's historically been one of the fastest growing areas of the grocery store. So Mondelez is our top pick in packaged foods, and our second pick uh, is the Kraft Heinz company. And we also made an upgrade in, to Kraft Heinz uh, a few months ago from a, from a hold to a buy. Uh, Kraft Heinz is a buy, but uh, Mondelez International is a, is a strong buy uh, for us. Arun, thank you as always for coming on the show. It's always good to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And coming up, closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
We're just minutes away from the closing bell on Wall Street. Let's take a look at today's trading action. And Josh, we got a little late day. There you go. Attempt yeah. mm -hmm. at a recovery. Not a full recovery. The Dow's still in the negative, but interesting here. And we're seeing that for all three major averages, although much smaller for the S&P 500. And the NASDAQ, a little bit, a little baby leg up. Yeah. As we head towards the close, you know, of course, we've been seeing buying in recent weeks. And now a little bit of a little pause. bit of a churn here. Yep. Yeah. The Makes question sense. is, as Lori Calvacino put it earlier, is this the pause that refreshes, so to speak? Um, I want to just take a look at where some of the gains are coming from. So let's equal weight it here. And some of it is coming from some of the stuff that's done poorly this year. Illumina, one of the movers I've been watching today, it's about 4%, got some positive analyst uh, talk, but also it's a stock that's done quite poorly this year. So maybe that's part of the deal. If you look at the Dow here and equal weight that as well, just to cl more clearly see, 3M rising on an upgrade today, Merck also getting a pop, and then finally looking at the sectors and looking at where the strength is coming from as we head straight uh, late into the day, real estate and industrials and healthcare are the ones in the green, lots of tech and materials selling that we're seeing on the downside. Yeah, coming off the kind of rallies you saw in November, maybe not so surprising, you're seeing a bit of, a bit of churn here. Yeah, and as we get towards the end of the year, we tend to see some rotation, you know, the worst performers, people buying, the best performers, people selling. So we can expect that in sort of fits and starts really throughout the month of December, and that would not be unusual to see here. There we got the closing bell on this Monday morning here, second trading day of December is where we are. And uh, again, seeing a decline for the markets today, but not as big as it was at cer certain points in the session. The uh, NASDAQ finishing lower by eight tenths of 1%, the S&P off by about a half of 1%, and the Dow trading lower by about a tenth of 1%. And as we've been talking about all show long, a lot of interesting action in other asset classes as well. Gold seeing a big spike up to record and then coming back down. Bitcoin going touching above 42,000, right? So definitely some interesting things happening on the margins of the market and in other uh, asset classes. I'm also seeing some uh, stats coming from our Jared Blickery as we close out the market here. The Russell 2000, the highest since September 1st. And that's something that, you know, we heard Lori Calvacino of RBC talk about it earlier today, but certainly she's not been the only one to flag that at this point in the cycle, small caps should start to pick uh, up a little bit here, pick up some momentum here. So that'll be something we continue to watch. All right, we'll see. Let's get to some tickers as well. First up is Uber. Shares there riding higher as the company is set to join the S&P 500 later this month. Effective prior to the open of trade on December 18th, the ride-sharing company, along with Jabil and Builders First Source, all to join the index, thus replacing Alaska Air Group, Sealed Air, and Solar Edge from that list. So, all right, so set to join the SPX, the S&P 500, so it's going to get cycled in there. And of course, we know that can help because investors buy funds that track the benchmark, mm -hmm. right? That stock has just vaulted higher this year, by the way. You're now about 140%. And the street now loves this name, by the way. 51 buys, mm. one hold, zero sells. Um, and this is going to be effective prior to the open of trading on Monday, December 18th. So not effective yet, but you do tend to see a lot of positioning ahead of these kinds of moves in and out of the indices. And, um, you know, not surprising here to see an Uber, to see a Jabil, to see a builder's first source uh, rising when you get this kind of announcement here um, because of the vast amounts of money that track the S&P 500 um, in ETF form. So that's why you tend to see these kinds of movements. It's kind of a technical move, but still an interesting one and, and can express the, the differences um, in the importance of, I mean, this one you could argue is a little belated, but still yeah. interesting to see it happen. And we did have, we had Lyft uh, CEO David Risher on recently too. Now Lyft not having the year that Uber has had, but I thought it was interesting, you know, Lyft, uh, David Risher talking tough, saying, you know what, we're focused, we're disciplined, we're going to stay dialed in here, we're focused on our riders and customers, yeah. and that kind of focus is going to drive growth and profitability. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. All right, let's talk about Carvana. Also, that stock popping after J.P. Morgan analysts upgraded it to neutral from underweight, and the analysts also raising their price target on Carvana as they believe the company can navigate economic uncertainty. The share's up 14%. This was a stealthy one for me. Do you know this stock is up 750% this year? It's a roller now, coaster, that one. It fell 98% right, last year, issue. right? Yeah. It went public in 2020 at 45 bucks. Um, and it has been a roller coaster, not just because of 
um, the sort of dynamics in the car buying market. Carvana heavily saddled with debt here, so that's something that has uh, caused some pause for some investors. Uh, but yeah, it's been an interesting one. But yeah, the, you know, it's not like the analysts at JP Morgan getting uber bullish. No, it's a neutral they, after right. all. Yeah, no, but they, still. so they upgrade your neutral, so not all in. To your yeah. point, they're not saying this is a buy. They did move to neutral from looks like underweight, mm -hmm. and so rel I guess relatively more positive. The upgrade they say is because of improvements in productivity, costs, and culture at the online used car dealer. Yeah. So modest, all right. I'm gonna end here on Starbucks. Let's check that out. Shares declining for 11th consecutive session, marking the longest route since Starbucks' public debut back in 1992. The run of losses comes amid growing concerns that sales trends have cooled. So this is a rough stretch here. What's going on is third-party data signals a material slowing at Starbucks in November. That is what JP Morgan was telling their clients in this note. They, in fact, lowered their Q1 U.S. Uh, comparable sales estimate to, to it looks like 4% growth compared to what they were looking compared with a year ago period. And you do wonder, is that another sign of consumer caution? You know, yeah, I mean, well, there is no better signal, I think you'd argue, maybe than, than Starbucks about potential consumer weakness. So that, that little, you know, downdraft on the right there is that 11 session slide that's taken the stock down by about 9%. So you could argue some of what um, John Ivancoe and the folks over at J.P. Morgan are saying it is already reflected in the stock. But, you know, if they're taking it here, uh, they're still, I should say, an overweight on the stock, even though they're making some of these negative commentary. But they're saying there could be a less successful Christmas holiday promotion um, with compared with the pumpkin spice latte. Mm. Pumpkin spice latte has become huge, obviously. Has maybe, it? That big, huh? Yeah. yeah I mean, People love pumpkin spice. Pumpkin spice coffee. Ugh. Yeah. No, thank you. I was going to say, I was gonna say with Bourdain to, once in a while. Everybody, spice, you know, everybody's can't. got their thing, right? And a lot for a lot of people, the thing is pumpkin spice latte. I actually like the Christmas blend at, uh, or the holiday, whatever they call it. I like the holiday blend yeah, yeah. at Starbucks. Not that I'm a huge Starbucks consumer, but, you know. I go every morning, but I stay very simple. You go every morning every to Starbucks? Every single morning. Every single morning. I didn't know that. I, well, You're I, a I, black I, coffee guy. Well, though. there's a point in which you, you hit yourself up with a double espresso every morning. At some, point, at some point, you just need it. It's not even really having an impact anymore. Yeah. Wait, wait, I, one more thing. Are you like a Pike's Place guy? Do you care? Do you, you just order no, coffee. You no, don't even it, request it, what you're it, getting. No, it doesn't matter to me. Just you're getting the Pike Place. Two then. shots over ice. I'm not that sophisticated. I just need the quick hit. I wasn't, you know, to your point, though, about the Starbucks, what's impressive is that this stock has done a whole bunch of nothing yeah. this year. I mean, at this point, after this route, you are basically dead flat. You're yes. down 1%. Yeah. yeah, so I don't know what the catalyst is for coming back. We'll see. Let's talk about airlines. Wall Street watching a merger in the airline sector. Alaska Airlines saying it's going to acquire Hawaiian Airlines for nearly $2 billion, including debt. But could the regulatory environment in Washington affect the future of this deal? Joining us now is Kravath Swain and more partner and former FTC commissioner Noah Phillips. Thank you so much for being here. So um, we know that this FTC has been quite active in general with regard to mergers, and even more so one could say with some of the airline mergers that have come forth. What do you think the chances are for this one? Well, Julie, it's great to be here with you. Um, so first of all, this is going to be the Department of Justice that looks at this merger, not the FTC. But I think your summary is absolutely accurate, which is to say this has been a very aggressive, and very active administration when it comes to antitrust and airlines. We already have two cases that were litigated or one is still in litigation, one involving American and JetBlue, that, that's the Northeast Alliance case, which the Department of Justice won, and another um, which is currently in court today involving JetBlue and Spirit. So you see very active regulators um, looking carefully at airline mergers. And Noah, let, let's say you were advising, you know, Alaska and Hawaiian on this one. I mean, what could they say, Noah? What could they do to try to placate the, the antitrust authorities here? Well, what the law commands and what the enforcers are supposed to do is look carefully at the competitive environment that the companies operate in and what the competitive dynamic between them is. So the best thing the companies can do is muster the facts at hand to show that they really don't compete very much and that the merger of the two companies wouldn't eliminate competition that meaningfully would affect the impact that we all feel as consumers when we fly on airlines every day. And no, I thought it was interesting too, the way they decide here to retain their separate brands. Was that, in your opinion, an attempt here to kind of extend an olive branch to the DOJ? 
I don't know that that would meaningfully impact the antitrust analysis. What the enforcers are looking at and what the law commands them to look at is the underlying economics of the transaction. So you have lots of companies that often have competing brands, but ultimately if they're owned by the same people, the government and the law are not going to assume that they're going to be operating as different companies. So I don't know that the brand really matters. It may matter for the companies and the business logic behind the deal. We've, of course, seen the executives talk about the really strong brand loyalty that each of the airlines have. So it's not clear to me that that's driven for anti by antitrust rationale. How similar do you think this case will be, if indeed the government does protest it, to the one that we are going to hear closing arguments on later this week, JetBlue and Spirit? Well, it's a little early to tell whether there'll be a case and how that case will look. Sure. But certainly the JetBlue Spirit merger is predicated on a dynamic where the government thinks that the merger is eliminating kind of a maverick, a really low cost competitive character carrier that they allege is really driving down prices across the industry, and the absence of which would allow those prices to rise. I don't know that we have that, that dynamic here, so it's not clear to me that that's where the government is going to work. And no, I, I saw an interesting stat um, in the journal today that after this sort of uh, wave of deals we've seen now, uh, four major U.S. carriers, Noah, now account for around 80 percent of the domestic market. If you're listening to that, you're a consumer, should that concern you? Well, it depends on the competitive outcome, right? I mean, 80% among four different firms, and then you've got a long tail of a lot of different firms. But the other critical thing, Josh, is you talked about the domestic market. And the truth is, both for purposes of the pricing that we all encounter as consumers and the way that the government analyzes these deals, it's not an overall domestic market that counts. It's the markets, the antitrust markets, that determine how airlines are pricing tickets. And what the government has done in many of its cases is look on a very granular, specific, root-by-root -root basis, because that's where they see the price competition taking place. Um, no, you've been at this a while. How do you view this particular you know, FTC, Department of Justice, administration generally in terms of its approach to M&A right now? Well, I think the rhetoric that we see um, is definitely a much more skeptical approach to M&A. So that's sort of point one. And I think in some of the policy approaches, when you talk about the reforms that they proposed to the hart scott Redino merger filing process or the proposed new merger guidelines, they're definitely signaling a willingness to intervene a lot more because of that skepticism about M&A and its impact on competition and really its social value generally. Um, we haven't yet seen that translate into like much, many more merger challenges, but the government is definitely saying that it wants to be aggressive in policing merger conduct. And Noah, if they, let's say Biden's DOJ you know, doesn't like the look of this and they, and they bring a case against Alaska and Hawaiian, we're heading to an election year here, Noah. If there was a change in the White House, um, could that affect that case? Could it be pulled with a new administration? You know, the history of antitrust does include some changes when administration shifts on the approach. But I think it's, first of all, it's obviously really too early to tell about something like an election. But I don't think we know how, even if uh, things were to shift, how a new administration might approach antitrust. To be clear, we had some aggressive enforcement in the last administration as well. Um, and so I don't know that were we to get to the point of a lawsuit and the administration were to change, we would necessarily see a difference. Noah Phillips, thank you so much for joining us today, Noah, for that time, that insight. Thanks for having me. And coming up, a fiery Supreme Court case. We delve into the latest out of the contested bankruptcy settlement for Purdue Pharma. That's after the break.
Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's gonna take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan. But I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. Four months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024. Roche has taken over a drug developer, Karma Therapeutics, in a bid to challenge Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly. Still marks Roche's return to the weight loss market. Yahoo Finance had the chance to speak with Allurian Technologies founder and CEO Dr. Shantanu Gore on his perspective on the increased focus in this race for obesity drugs. Seeing obesity in the news every day and so much interest from investors, patients and providers has been a breath of fresh air in the obesity space over the past decade. And I want to underscore one thing. I really do believe these medications are great tools for patients who have obesity, but they are not going to be the cure for obesity. If you think about blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, we have hundreds of drugs to treat these chronic diseases, but yet they still are very, very prevalent uh, all over the world. And the reason is uh, many of these drugs require lifelong use, and we all know that adherence rate to medications is extremely low, even with GLP-1s two-thirds of patients who start a GLP-1 drug will stop within the first year. And so there's a lot of work ahead of us when it comes to medications, and I really believe that they are not going to be the single long-term cure-all for the obesity epidemic. So do you believe that people and the broader consumer environment that has in some form or another cozied up to GLP-1s or other obesity and, and weight loss drugs, do you think they fully understand what they're getting into in these cases then. I mean, when you're talking about you have to continue to take this over an extended period of time, if not for life, as I believe you just mentioned a moment ago, then what type of long-term implications are we talking about? What other types of uh, conditions could, could arise more broadly among the cohort uh, that, is, that is taking on some of these drugs? There's a series of issues here. I think the general public and patients in general don't realize uh, that once you stop taking these drugs, the weight can come right back on. There's not enough of a focus on behavior change and lifestyle modification, and that's one thing we pride ourselves on at Allurion, combining these tools with best-in-class behavior change so people can actually change their lifestyle and actually keep this weight off in the long run. You know, With these drugs, too, being used at higher doses than they've ever been, there's really no long-term data on what happens to patients after several years or several decades of therapy. There's already some indications that these drugs may have uh, impacts on thyroid cancer incidents or pancreatic cancer incidents or a host of other diseases that could actually give rise to even bigger problems for patients who have obesity. So there are a lot of unknowns out there, no doubt about it. These drugs have been a great boon for many, many patients, and they've created a ton of awareness uh, amongst millions of people around the world who are struggling with obesity, but they are not gonna be the be all end all in the obesity epidemic. There's going to be a requirement really for different so sorts of therapies for different sorts of patients. And then there's also the affordability aspect of all this. I'm curious how you're approaching this and trying to make your offering I guess, accessible to as many people as possible? Well, at Allurion, we, we don't believe that you need to be on a medication or a device or, or a drug mm -hmm. for your entire life. We believe that through lifestyle modification and behavior change, you can actually keep the weight off in the long haul. And so what we've developed at Allurion is a device that you can swallow in a 15-minute office visit. It's a balloon that sits inside your stomach, helps you feel full. 
And that balloon disappears after four months. And in that four month period of time, we help you change your lifestyle, modify your behavior through artificial intelligence. We have something called Coach Iris, which is a 24 seven weight loss coach there to answer all of your questions that you have as you go through your weight loss journey. And we have a behavior change program, proprietary behavior change program that we've developed in house at Allurion that's delivered through our mobile platform so that patients actually can get the type of coaching, the type of behavior change and lifestyle modification advice and counseling that they need. And our patients will lose 30 pounds of weight or 15% of their total body weight in just four months. It's a very fast weight loss when you have a balloon like this sitting inside your stomach helping you feel full and they'll maintain 95% of that weight loss at one year. So unlike these drugs, when our balloon disappears from your stomach, it's not like the weight comes right back on, but if you're taking a GLP-1 drug, the moment you stop injecting yourself, you're going to see the weight come back with a vengeance. Is the balloon collecting data? I I'm sorry if this is a dumb question, but I mean, there's so many kind of conversations that we've continued to hear around um, embeddable technology and I mean, the balloon disappears, so I guess, you know, it's, it's limited in scope how much data it would be collecting. But is there kind of a, a collection that takes place on top of that that is allowing people to have kind of better example of their biometrics? Can you just kind of explain how this works? Yeah, we're collecting actually a lot of useful data that our providers and patients find incredibly valuable. Every patient who gets our balloon gets our Bluetooth scale. Uh, they get our uh, health tracker smartwatch if they have their own wearables like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit that works with our platform too. And so we're able to track patients' weight, their activity, their exercise, their sleep, uh, and you know monitor all of that as they go through their weight loss journey. We make that data available to the provider who actually gave them the balloon so that provider can actually track those patients in real time and intervene if there are any issues as the patient goes through their weight loss journey. And on top of all of that data, we have a very powerful suite of machine learning algorithms and an AI platform that's constantly combing through the data, looking for patients who might not be on track for success. One of our machine learning algorithms can actually predict within the first 20 days of someone getting our balloon, mm -hmm. what their four month outcome is gonna look like. And so the data that we've collected is incredibly powerful. As of now, the balloon is not collecting any data or transmitting anything back to the app, no. uh, but TBD and stay tuned on that front. That was Alurion Technologies founder and CEO, Dr. Shantanu Gore on the efforts towards addressing obesity. Well, the bankruptcy settlement of Purdue Pharmaceuticals hangs in the balance of the Supreme Court. Our Alexis Keenan is here with the details. Obviously, this has been closely, closely watched. Yes, and a long time going and things still not settled in this case. Now, what is happening here is the U.S. trustee, which operates as a watchdog for the Justice Department over Chapter 11 cases, these big cases, and in this case, a $6 billion uh, settlement wrapped up in the bankruptcy between Purdue and victims of opioid litigation, also states and local governments that are part of this settlement. So a big $6 billion at stake here because the U.S. trustee, they say that who shouldn't be part of this settlement? Who shouldn't get a release from liability? The Sackler family, the family that owned and controlled Purdue all the way up until it agreed to release its ownership and release control within this bankruptcy. So the U.S. trustee, not necessarily a party here, but in its watchdog capacity saying, this is not the way that things should go, that the bankruptcy court should not have the power to release a party when there are still some claimants in this opioid litigation that want to be able to bring individual suits against the Sacklers. They argue that the Sacklers took a bunch of money from the company, transferred it into offshore accounts to the tune of, according to the justices in the conversations today in court, $11 billion, wow. some of that being repatriate, repatriated in order to fund this $6 billion settlement, not all of it. Uh, but that's what the, uh, the arguments were today. You had uh, government lawyers up there. You also had uh, the Purdue lawyers arguing that this agreement should go through. And then you had a lawyer for the claimants here. By the way, they want this settlement. They want this $6 billion to be the end. They want to get a distribution. They want to be paid for the injuries they say that they have um, been caused by this drug. And, and Alexis, you were kind of talking here before we got started about sort of maybe the impact, the influence this could have kind of broadly on bankruptcy law? Yeah, so the deal in bankruptcy in Chapter 11 is that 
it's a bargain. In order to get the bargain and the benefit of being released from future liabilities, because that's what's tied to this $6 billion payment, is that forever and a day, the Sacklers, Purdue, were, will no longer be beholden to this litigation. They will be able to walk away from it. In exchange for that, you have to put all your money on the table. You have to put your money into the bankruptcy estate. And so the U.S. trustee here is saying, Sacklers, you didn't do that. That was company money. It went offshore, and now we're having to deal with it in this backwards way. So the U.S. trustee not really liking that. And it's a really interesting uh, concept for bankruptcy going forward because this could ultimately change how bankruptcy courts are able to handle these, uh, th these distributions of funds, particularly in this mass tort area where you have so many claimants who want a piece of the pie. All right, Just we'll keep saying. watching. Alexis, thank you so much for that. And coming up, Beyonce's concert film, Renaissance, hit theaters this past weekend. We're going to bring you the box offers numbers after the break. Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Josh Schaefer here with Madison Mills and Praz Subramanian. And we're gonna run through a couple stories. And first I wanna kick off with some slimming down we're seeing in the tech world. Spotify and Twilio today announcing layoffs. First being reported, uh, Spotify specifically by the Wall Street Journal. You see there's 17% of the workforce at Spotify going to be cut, 5% of the workforce at Twilio. Maddie, the biggest thing that stands out to me when I think about this is just, we started the year talking about tech layoffs, right? Mm -hmm. 
both of these companies have now gone through three rounds of layoffs, sort of trying to figure out what the right size is yeah. for their company. And we're still talking about it at the end of the year. And of course, this coming in a week where we get a lot of labor data. Right. And do we see that starting to match in the data? You always want to see when you see these headlines, what does it actually mean for the overall jobs market in the economy? Or is it just something we're talking about with tech or something we're talking about with specific companies sure. or are layoffs starting to become part of the story here in the labor market as we head into 24. Right, is this a crack that we're gonna yeah. start seeing deep in as we head into the new year, like you said. Spotify to me, guys, feels like the perfect example of a company that does really well in a free money mm -hmm. market, spending billions of dollars on you know streaming and, and music partnerships with different studios, and then also obviously in their podcast investments. That doesn't work so well when money is a little bit more expensive and when you've got all of this credit tightening. So maybe Fed cuts help them, but I don't know, they're trying really hard to get to, I want to say, uh, a range of 90 to 108 million in profit, and uh, previously they're at 37. They got a long way to go. Yeah, you, you mentioned that the company made, made money last quarter, actually, but they need to, quote, right-size the workforce. Yeah. You mentioned that free money era kind of being over, and do they kind of see maybe, uh, we got to spend more money on music licensing, because these mm -hmm. artists are talking about how you need 400,000 streams just to get paid for as if it's minimum wage. I mean, you're starting to see that maybe there's more costs that are gonna to come to them that they need to kind of fix now, but how much hiring did, did they do before that made it so so bad they need to cut mm. back Twilio, also you mentioned. Also, crews, potentially, they're on the hook for thousands of job cuts depending on how they sort of wanna change up the business because given the fact they're gonna be sort of re-strategizing what they're up to. Well, to me, and it's just a reminder of the fact that while we're starting to talk about rate cuts, the impacts of the rate hikes, we haven't seen all of them, right? Well said. And, and that's sort of the, the stage that we're at here is we're still waiting for the quote unquote lagging impacts. Everyone wants to call them lagging impacts, right, from the rate hikes, but we haven't seen a lot of those fully come through yet with these companies. So that story is still to play out, per se. And, pro, pro, sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry. I, I saw a uh, kind of a, a flip side of that. I saw uh, Tom Keen, Bloomberg, tweeted out this, yeah. this piece about a little bit of information about how there's actually not a lot of debt issuance because people or companies got such good cheap debt right. back in that free money era that like we're just sitting on that we're not gonna, we're just going to keep paying that out we're not going to ever uh, you know sort of re uh, what's it called like redo that debt right that's yeah. not going to happen we're going to stay with what we got. But the clock's ticking, right? And yeah. if they do have to sort of refinance that refinance. debt, it's going to come. You, <laughs> Re I know, redo I know what whatever saying. they wanted to do. I know do. what you're saying. And that's a better way to phrase it. Like in finance, we always Let's have these it. words that make it so much more complicated. It's not that complicated. <laughs> um, so I, I was totally with you. But you're right. If they do have to refinance, it's going to be so much more expensive this time around. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you gotta wonder how's how's Joe Rogan doing out there? How's he feeling about his paycheck in this environment? Yeah. 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 Um, well, st speaking of <laughs> steep paychecks, we're in a renaissance <laughs> of music tour films at cinemas. Beyonce's concert movie bringing in over twenty million dollars in its box office debut. You guys, I'm seeing it tomorrow night, uh, so I'm very excited for that. But um, obviously, not as much here as the Taylor Swift movie had, which was in the tune of uh, ninety-eight million, I believe, on its first weekend. Uh, really funny info from AMC today, mm -hmm. though, that I wanted to bring to the chat today. Uh, they issued rules for attendees of the movie, because I know you remember that um, there was a lot of chaos at the Taylor Swift movie yeah. with, like, cult dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are rules about not doing fanography if you're going to see the Beyonce movie, which I know both of you need needed to hear that. I mean, you gotta just let it be lawless in there, right? You're gonna let me see a concert in a movie theater, have some fun, do whatever. I, I, that's what I feel like if it's gonna be a concert scene. Yeah. People are gonna stand up, they're gonna dance, the they're, they're gonna sing, like, I don't know, that's what personally I would expect from it, but I guess at some point it is still a movie theater process, so you gotta tame it down a little bit. Uh, yeah, I guess so, but I guess people want that concert move, concert going experience and maybe in the movie theater in a different setting. You can see more, it's a bit more contained. Um, you know, are we seeing a renaissance in concert films, right? We had, you know, back in the day we had the uh, the, the Last Wall, which was about the band, and, and then they had the reissue of Stop Making Sense, right? The uh, mm. Talking Heads uh, uh, theater film that people sort of went crazy for again. Uh, makes me think, is it because concerts are so expensive? Right. Uh, I'm not sure but there's definitely some feeling people want to go to the theaters and have this fun, have this fun communal experience and uh, maybe they can do some fanography or, or not, <laughs> right? It's interesting to see those Beyonce numbers come in lower than Taylor Swift. I guess interesting in the sense of like, yes, I would expect that, but then you wonder like how low can it come in and the movie theater still pumped about it. Mm -hmm. Beyonce leading the box office, I think says victory, 
but who can who else can you sort of go to? I wonder where we go from here with the concerts in the movies thing because I would think after a while, like I'm not going to all these. It just Taylor Swift, Beyonce, sure. Beyond that, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I really wanted that number to be higher so that I could <laughs> say that she had more power, but you know, it's tough. It's well, tough. I guess there's also the Depeche Mode film that I need to go see at some point, being, being someone from that era. But Josh we're and going I are first back. In line. Yeah. We're going back also <laughs> to my past. Also, to my to my to my hometown. Chicago, where McDonald's looks to create a nostalgic spinoff with the cosmic uh, sort of spinoff chain here. You know, I guess there's some reports of a, a new branch going up in Bolingbrook, Illinois, very 50s-esque uh, sh uh, shake and burger place. You know, it's so hot right now, obviously, with with um, uh, Five Guys and, and like we mentioned, uh, In-N-Out, places mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, I think that's sort of what they're capitalizing. And they're capitalizing on McDonald's past as one of those burger and shake sp uh, spots. And I just gotta say, uh, it's a tough spot, tough space, very competitive space, but you know, McDonald's has the know-how in, 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 in supply chain and materials and, sure. and all that sort of thing. So it can't count them out there, but I don't know, what do you guys think about that? I, I'm fired up. I mean, come on, would it be fun, right? If McDonald's could come up with, like you said, sort of a 1950s, 1950s, 60s s thing like when you go to a well done Sonic there are like different Sonics in the mm -hmm. world right there are some Sonics that are a little bit more fast foodie and then you go to certain Sonics that are like the only one in that city or something you've ever been and you do the drive up or you ever went when they actually have roller skaters yeah it's, it's fun. fun it's fun it's fun to get a burger and a shake yeah. like I like McDonald's <laughs> getting behind that and switching up the name too right so yeah. it's not just you know McDonald's with something else on right. it people are coming expecting something different yeah. I think it could be fun yeah, I mean, I'm all for it. I, I feel like they kind of teased us with this with all of the Grimace sales mm -hmm. in the third quarter that did so well with the Grimace milkshake. It was kind of, I think the CEO said, like, this is the milkshake quarter, the third quarter yeah. here. Um, so it's like a nostalgia play. I, I, I do it. think, though, like, does a milkshake go with a burger that well? I don't really That's know. That's a weird if, take. I don't really know if they go together that well. Like I like the burger and I like a milkshake, but like I don't know if I need them together. Well, maybe in those days it's a burger shake and a, and a smoke, maybe. Back in yeah, those days. I don't know. It just yeah, doesn't guys. quite do it for me. But I guess I'll have to go to this new McDonald's in Chicago, right? Prosper, yeah, Dome, we're going. Yeah. But stick with us after this break. We're going to be speaking with Andrew founder Palmer Lukey as they launch super fast as they launch a super fast drone, their next line of defense tech.
Ford out with the latest data on its November sales. Here with the details, Yahoo Finance is prospering. And so what stands out from that data? So sales down about a half percent, slightly to 145,000 units, but it's mostly about EV and hybrid sales kind of powering the way for Ford here. Uh, EV sales up 43% to nearly 9,000 units. Uh, kind of a sliver to Tesla, but still makes it the number two EV seller in the United States. Uh, hybrid sales also sales up 75% to 12,000 units, powered by the Maverick pickup and also the F-150 Lightning, uh, sorry, F-150 Hybrid, not the Lightning. Those sales are doing well as well. Uh, and sticking with trucks, sales fell about 2, 2.83% to around 80,000 units because of the fact that it's possible they're restarting these plants after the UAW strike. So might have been a little bit of um, slow down there in the beginning of the month to get ramped up, but still a decent month or for, yeah, decent November for Ford. Also very good EV sales. Hmm. Interesting stuff, but internal combustion overall seeing a decline. A uh, slight, yeah, slight, yeah. A slight yeah. decline. Um, so how does this feed into overall Ford's plans when it comes to EVs? As you said, seeing some gains, but still small compared to something like Tesla. Yeah, I think this is the reality that they, they are in now is the fact that they know they're going to see the EV transitions happening just, just not as fast as they'd like it to. So, of course, they pull back some of that spending, pull back some of that build out in the, in the plants, and they're saying, hey, we're going to keep doing this, but maybe at a smaller scale. I mean, we just mentioned, you know, 9,000 units. That's like a week for Tesla, right? I mean, it's like a very small amount given what the, the king of EVs is doing. So it's going to take a long time for them to catch up to actually build scale and make money. I think I still didn't realize that Tesla was so far ahead in the, num in the sheer number of EVs it's selling versus the competition. Maybe be just because anecdotally I've been seeing more like, what are they called, ID4s or whatever right, the, the VW is, yeah, yeah, yeah. or the Ionics from, from Hyundai. Like anecdotally, I feel like I've been seeing a lot more of those. Well, I think it's a good point. If you Add it all up, you're seeing a lot of other mm. non-Tesla EVs out there, but but then inevitably you see how many EVs out where you're at, right? Or right. Tesla's at, Tesla's yes, right. Yes, right, exactly, yeah, right, yes. Right. And any individual of those isn't right. up to what Tesla is. King of EVs, you heard it from Frost. Yeah, the king. I guess so. Yeah. Frost. Off the cuff here. You know, just... <laughs> Frost, thank you, appreciate it. Thanks. Defense tech company Anduril has now unveiled its newest product. Roadrunner is an AI-powered combat drone that can fly at hundreds of miles per hour. It's just the latest product from Anduril, which competes with big established defense contractors like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman. Now to talk more about Anduril's portfolio, strategy, and future is founder of Palmer, Lucky Palmer. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to dig right in to Roadrunner, Palmer. Just walk me through why you decided to build this product. Product, Palmer. What's the problem you all are trying to solve for? Well, we launched two products, Roadrunner and Roadrunner M. Roadrunner is a vertical takeoff and landing high-speed jet aircraft that's powered by two thrust vector turbojet engines. Uh, Roadrunner M is a variant airframe of the Roadrunner product that is equipped with a high explosive warhead, a long-range seeker, and that allows it to go after high-speed jet-powered threats that the military is facing. So whether they're suicide drones, group three, four, five UAS that are launching strikes on our troops and our partners, these are the types of vehicles that are becoming a massive threat to our troops and to our partners and to our allies. We started working on this two years ago because I saw this becoming a huge threat. I didn't believe that the United States had the tools we needed to address these ever more deadly drones that our adversaries are throwing against us. Roadrunner is the result of that. In two years, we've used our own money to build something that is capable of going up against those high-end threats. We already have one U.S. military customer, and we're going to be rolling it out to a whole bunch more in the very near future. And, and Palmer, can you give us any kind of insider color into the, the price of Roadrunner? You've, you've secured one customer already, as you noted, but any, any color you can provide about the price point? Roadrunner is a hell of a deal. We are selling it right now today for low hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that is in low rate production. It's gonna get even cheaper as we make more of them, even cheaper as we optimize the design. And we're competing with systems that cost more, sometimes up to millions of dollars, and our system is reusable and recoverable where theirs is not. It's really not even close. And Palmer, more generally, taking a step back, you know, you all at Andrew, you're competing against, you know, big established defense companies, Palmer. So yep. Lockheed Martins and Northrop Grumman's, these are big companies, deep pockets, sizable R&D budgets. They got long histories with U.S. government agencies. For investors listening right now, Palmer, what are Andrew's competitive advantages there? We have really good people. We have really good process. We set the right incentives. Because we're a defense product company more than a defense contractor, 
We don't make money by dragging contracts out. We don't make money by having more cost so we can have more plus. We make money when we move fast. We make money when we are efficient. And in a world where 80% of the major weapons programs are going to just five companies in a world where almost 60% of those programs have only a single bidder. There is a lot of room for a company like Anduril to come in. Our mission from the beginning was to save taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars a year as we make tens of billions of dollars a year. We're not there yet. We've got a long way to go, but I think that we're well on the way. And Palmer, for folks who are listening right now, when they think about modern warfare, I bet a lot of folks still think of tanks, they think of battleships, they think of fighter jets. When you think about the future of modern warfare and how Anduril is positioned for that, has the nature of warfare fundamentally changed, Palmer? It's fundamentally changed, but it's got a lot further to change. Future conflicts are not going to be decided by small numbers of exquisite high-end systems, nor are we going to be able to deploy the types of quantities we've seen that have always been limited by the number of people who can pilot them, who can crew them. The future of war is going to be defined by massive numbers of autonomous systems cranked out by the nations that have the industrial firepower to do so. And we need autonomy and artificial intelligence that are sufficient to power those at a scale that no manned product could ever do. That's why our core product is something called Lattice AI. It's the underpinning of every hardware product we make, and it's integrated with even more third-party weapon systems than Anduril weapon systems. It's the thing that allows you to command and control hundreds or thousands of autonomous weapon systems in a given battle space under the direction of a small number of people who can be making the right decision at the right time with near perfect awareness of what's happening and what will happen as a result. And so the audience understands, Palmer, a bit about your history too. You know, you, you sold your first startup, uh, VR company Oculus to Facebook, I think for, for $2 billion, Palmer. You were 21 years, 20 years, 21 years old, if I remember right. At that point, Palmer, you could have done anything you wanted to, right? You could have pursued any kind of company. Why did you decide, you know what, I'm gonna focus on defense. I'm gonna focus on national security because it was the most impactful thing that I could work on. And also because people were not working on it who should have been working on it. You know, if the United States has a long history of our most innovative tech companies working hand in hand with the DOD. That's where Silicon Valley came from. We wouldn't have Silicon Valley if it weren't for that tight relationship. But we moved into a world where everyone was bending over for China. They were refusing to work for the DOD and with the duty, not for cultural reasons. Those are an ideological smokescreen thrown up by executives. It was because they could not do anything that would threaten their manufacturing in China, their investment from China, and most importantly, their ability to sell into the Chinese market. Tech companies thought China was gonna be the next big market. Imagine if pre-World War II, if our most innovative technology companies had seen Imperial Japan as their biggest future customer. Imagine if during the Cold War, if Bell Laboratories and if Westinghouse and Boeing had said, you know, we don't really wanna pick sides. We can't do anything politically incorrect here. We think the Soviet Union's important to keep happy. That was the experiment that was being run in the 20 teens when I started Anduril. I wanted to get people out of those companies and put them into a company that can unabashedly, unashamedly work on national security and work to secure U.S. interests. I also looked at working on prison reform and solving obesity by making petroleum-based food products. But I decided that defense national security was the area that needed me a lot more and that was also a lot more aligned with my technical abilities. And, and Palmer, you, know, you mentioned China there, increasing geopolitical tensions between Washington and Beijing. If there was ever conflict, if there was ever war between the U.S. and China, Palmer, which country has the military advantage? I mean, it depends on what the objectives, uh, objectives are, right? It's very unlikely that you're going to have China and uh, America kind of toe-to-toe -to, -toe to try and beat the other nation fully, so much as trying to accomplish their strategic interests. Everyone knows what the fight is at this point. It's over Taiwan. Everyone knows that China has their eye on Taiwan. Xi says that he will reunify China with Taiwan by force if necessary, and that is what it's going to take. And so the question isn't who would win in a fight. It's not my dad can beat up your dad. It's which dad is going to be the one that accomplishes the strategic objective of either bringing Taiwan into the author authoritarian regime of the Chinese Communist Party or preserves their right to self-govern as a democracy with the protection of a bunch of partners who depend on them for their economies to work. Of all the countries in the world that we have an interest in, 
Taiwan ranks very near the top given the importance of their semiconductor industry and their electronics industry. Without that, our economy will not only be subservient to China, but in shambles. And Palmer, you, you founded Enderrol in 2017. Just six years later, this company is now valued at nearly $10 billion. Will Enderrol IPO, Palmer? And if so, what's the timeline there? We're definitely going to IPO. I don't know if I can say exactly what the timeline is because I actually don't know what it is. To be honest, it's likely going to be dependent less on what we're doing than how the external markets look right now. Oh, look, I've got a healthy company. I have private investors who believe in my vision, believe in what we're doing. We have a lot of cash in the bank and we're winning hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts on track to win a billion dollars in contracts uh, you know, in a single year. I mean, we're doing really well. I don't have to IPO. I don't have to go to public markets. So for me, it's going to be about when the markets are looking good, when I think I can make a compelling pitch to institutional investors that Anderol is a safe company, it is a great place for their money to be, and it's a company that has a huge, long growth trajectory and growth tail that they can be a part of. I think it's good for defense companies to be something that everyone in America can be a part of. I do not think it would be good if our defense base was locked in the hands of a few private investors. That's my personal opinion. Palmer, I want to get you out here on this question. We're headed into an election year here. If it is Biden-Trump polls show at this point, you've seen them, it's basically a toss-up. Does it matter for Anderil's business who's ultimately in the White House? I don't think so. I, you know, there's There's been a lot made of the fact that I supported Trump, and that was one of the reasons that I was fired by Facebook. Um, but I think that the DOD prides itself on being nonpartisan, and the White House recognizes its role in allowing the military to perform their mission regardless of who's in the White House year to year. I mean, Andrews made more money under Biden than under Trump, and we're going to make even more money over whoever the next person in the White House is, because I think there is that bipartisan recognition. Now, I'm a Republican. The CEO of Anderol is a Democrat. I do fundraisers for Republicans. He does fundraisers for Democrats. How is it that two people on opposite sides of the aisle are able to run a company like Anderol together? It's simple. We believe in something that's more important than partisan politics, and our employees believe that too. We have Democrats here. We have Libertarians here. We have Republicans here. We have a whole range of people here. You're not a lot of communists, but we have a lot of other political <laughs> persuasions, and everyone agrees that the most important thing is the security of our country, the security of our freedoms, and secondarily to that, the freedoms of our partners and allies around the world, and that's more important than red or blue. All right. Well, somehow, Andrew has figured out how to make bipartisan politics work. Maybe there's a, a lesson there for Congress and lawmakers. Palmer Lucky, Maybe thank you is. so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Thank you. God bless you. And coming up, what to watch tomorrow. We're going to break down these stories you need to know to start your day.
Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's going to take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now, this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan. But I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. For months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024. Time now for what to watch on Tuesday. On the earnings front, J.M. Smucker, Toll Brothers, Dave & Buster's, they're all reporting earnings tomorrow. Smucker reporting before the bell and looking to reevaluate the rest of the year after acquiring Hostess in November. Toll Brothers and Dave & Buster's reporting after the bell. Toll Brothers looking to build on its strong results from the third quarter, while Dave & Buster's hoping that store expansions will be enough to overcome decline forecasts. Moving on to the job market, the Bureau of Labor Statistics releasing everyone's favorite, its monthly JOLTS report. October estimates suggest a bump is coming for job openings ahead of Friday's job support. Over to the gaming space, Grand Theft Auto 6, the long-awaited installment in the hugely popular Rockstar Games franchise, it's dropping its debut trailer. Gamers are going to get a taste of a new GTA for the first time in 10 years. And that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.